You are listening to The Bridge Busters, The First Dam Busters and The Race to Save Britain, written by Mark Felton, published by Mandalay Books, and narrated by Mark Felton. Chapter 9. Sea Lion It is now considered desirable as a first priority to intensify our attacks on enemy ports and shipping against the threat of invasion. This order had arrived at Five Group from Air Marshal Portal at Bomber Command early on the 4th of July 1940, written in the calm and clinical manner adopted in official correspondence. But the headquarters personnel were feeling far from calm. In fact, a degree of panic was rapidly setting in, as it was increasingly suspected that a German invasion was no longer a theoretical exercise, but a distinct and very real possibility. Britain was not properly prepared. Bomb gone, Pilot Officer Edie yelled as the Hamden he was flying in flashed across the top of Aqueduct M25A on the night of the 7th of July. As navigator in the front cupola, he winced as a searchlight beam flashed in his eyes, totally blinding him. Seconds before, as pilot, Flight Lieutenant Fanny Futrell had lined up on the target and opened his bomb doors, a blizzard of 20mm flak shells had shot towards the plane, one of several Hamdens from No. 61 Squadron out of Hemswell that were making one of the nuisance raids on the Dortmund Ems Canal ordered by Air Marshal Portal. Since the first raid in June, the Germans had progressively stiffened the defences around the two aqueducts, conscious of the sudden British interest in the structures. Futrell's Hamden was targeted by no less than four flak batteries, the light anti-aircraft cannons spitting thumb-sized tracer rounds into the sky like garden hoses, creating a storm of shrapnel that soon shredded Futrell's aircraft. His M-bomb probably missed, for no damage was recorded, but the German flak gunners did not. Port engines had it, Futrell screamed as a shell wrecked his plane's left power plant. Flak continued to smash through the plane's wings and tail. Pulling back on the yoke, Futrell applied maximum revs to the remaining good engine, going for altitude. His eyes were glued to the altimeter as the needle climbed painfully slowly. He made his decision in a couple of seconds. The kite was a goner. He pressed the emergency abandon aircraft button and simultaneously yelled into his RT, Bail out, chaps! Bail out now! Then he took his hands off the control column and reached up to the canopy release toggles. Futrell slammed his cockpit canopy back and struggled to rise in his seat as a tornado of cold wind threatened to force him back into the stricken aircraft. But with a great effort, he was suddenly free, half falling and half diving from the plane, which was staggering in the air at a few hundred feet. As he fell, he grabbed for his parachute ripcord and wrenched it hard, the white canopy billowing open above him with a violent snap before he hit the ground hard a few seconds later, pain lancing through his back from the heavy landing. Ventral gunner Sergeant Goaith and radio operator Sergeant Ken Wood had also managed to scramble from the stricken plane, their parachutes opening safely and they floated down to earth. But pilot officer Edie never made it. As the plane entered a terminal dive, he struggled to try and open the small forward escape hatch and bail out. He went in with the plane, which was turned into a fireball a couple of miles from where Futrell and the rest of the crew landed. The three survivors unhooked their parachute harnesses and struggled to their feet, Futrell breathing hard from the pain in his back. The two NCOs ran over to their skipper. In the distance they could see flickering flames from where their Hamden had crashed. They had no idea of what had become of Edie, but hoped that he had landed safely some distance away. Back over the canal, gun flashes and dancing searchlights and the drone of their comrades' aircraft continuing the attack lit the night sky. Suddenly they heard voices, followed by shouts and the flash of handheld torches close by. Several grey-uniformed German soldiers came running out of the darkness, brandishing rifles, which they pointed at the three RAF airmen. Hande hock! yelled a sergeant, gesturing with his Luger pistol that the British should raise their hands. 
Futrell glanced at Gawaith and Wood. Well, boys, looks as though we're in the bag. Better do as the nice man says, he said rather breathlessly, and wincing from his back pain, he raised his hands high above his head. The punishing cycle of raids on the aqueducts would continue to claim more victims over the coming weeks, further thinning out the overworked squadrons. Meine Herren, der Führer, announced an immaculately uniformed SS adjutant at the door to the Berghof's Great Hall. Seconds later, Adolf Hitler, the new master of Europe, strode purposefully into his private home's huge reception room and approached a line of generals and admirals who had recently arrived by a fleet of large black Mercedes staff cars from nearby Salzburg airport. Hitler wore a field-grey tunic and black trousers, the First World War Iron Cross first class and wound badge pinned to his left breast pocket, silently demonstrating to his followers his past battlefield courage as a corporal in the trenches of Flanders. Each middle-aged officer stiffened to attention as Hitler approached, the Führer's right arm flopping out a slightly disinterested German greeting before he shook hands with each of them in turn, fixing them with his hard blue eyes that seemed to many to pierce right through to their very souls. The Berghof, Hitler's huge alpine chalet above the Bavarian town of Berchtesgaden, was, on the 13th of July 1940, his military headquarters and the scene of a very important meeting. The room was pleasant, its white walls hung with enormous Jovelin tapestries and old master oil paintings, the vaulted wooden ceiling complemented by thick carpets. At one end was a great red marble fireplace, with sofas and armchairs arranged around it, while at the other was an enormous picture window, which on fine days could be lowered into the floor. The view beyond the massive window was of the Untersberg Mountains and Hitler's homeland of Austria beyond. Before the window was an equally enormous wooden desk, its surface completely covered with maps of all sizes. They all showed one location, the British Isles. Hitler invited his guests over to the table, and the conference began. For some months, the German navy and army had been contemplating a possible invasion of England. Hitler still hoped for a negotiated peace settlement with the British, but Winston Churchill showed no signs of wanting one. Now, Hitler had to decide what course of action to take against the recalcitrant British. The Führer leaned over the table, staring at the maps, while Grand Admiral Erich Rader, the head of the navy, presented his plans. Hitler interrupted often, and his questions demonstrated his incredible memory for facts and figures. Then Field Marshal Walter von Brauchisch, Commander-in-Chief of the Army, presented his plans for a series of landings along England's south coast. Standing behind Hitler, Field Marshal Wilhelm Keitel lived up to his nickname of the Nodding Ass by agreeing with every one of Hitler's suggestions, while Colonel General Franz Halder, head of the Army High Command, adjusted his rimless pince-nez spectacles and added his carefully composed thoughts. At the end of the table, the bald Colonel General Alfred Jodl, Chief of the Operations Staff, stood with his arms crossed, a serious expression on his face as he listened intently. Hitler was jovial and supportive. He had good reason to be. He had conquered Europe. Only Britain continued to fight, but he suspected that the fighting on the continent and the ignominious withdrawal of her shattered army from Dunkirk had fatally weakened her. Hitler was, he had remarked to Halder, greatly puzzled by England's persisting unwillingness to make peace. Field Marshal Brauchisch and the Army High Command were all for invading, and their plan, codenamed Operation Sea Lion, was convincing, if the RAF could be eliminated from the equation. Germany had to achieve aerial superiority over the English Channel and southeastern counties. At the conclusion of the meeting that day, the groundwork had been laid at the very highest level to begin the invasion of England. Three days later, Hitler issued Führer Directive No. 16. It began with the following chilling words. Since Britain, despite its hopeless military situation, still shows no indication of a desire to come to terms with us, I have decided to prepare an invasion. Sea Lion would, if all went well, 
be ready to launch by mid-August 1940 at the earliest. What the RAF quickly christened the Battle of the Barges commenced on the 4th of July 1940. The Germans were in the process of gathering 2,400 canal barges from across Europe for conversion into ad hoc landing craft. This figure included 860 from Germany, 1,200 from Holland and Belgium, and 350 vessels from France. After the 16th of July, these vessels were no longer carrying supplies. Rather, they were destined to become landing craft to carry the German army onto the beaches of England's south coast. They were moving steadily along the canal system and across the aqueducts, or else could be found in large numbers in the various ports of the west, in particular at Antwerp, which now became the focus of British attacks. The British had clearly identified the threat. Now it was up to Bomber Command to neutralise that threat. Right chaps, Downwind Gillen said to the assembled pilots of 49 Squadron in the briefing room at RAF Skempton. I have some pictures of sea basin at Antwerp. Everyone stiffened in their chairs and tried to read Gillen's face to judge his mood. Yesterday there were 400 barges there, Gillen continued. Today's reconnaissance shows 350. This was good news. The pattern for each raid was the same. The crews from 49 and 83 squadrons, along with others from five group stations, assaulted Antwerp at night, trying to do as much damage as they could with bombs and machine guns. Then, a PDU Spitfire would conduct a photo-reconnaissance overflight during daylight the following day. The squadron commanding officers would then gather their pilots and navigators together, and based on the latest photographs, lecture them on their performances. Who was on sea basin? Gillen asked. A chair scraped as a young flight commander stood at the back of the room. Babe Leroyd and the other officers turned in their seats as the victim stood awaiting for the axe to fall. Well, you sank fifty, you and the rest. But that is not enough, Gillen said rather sharply. The flight commander nodded and took his seat, and the rest of the pilots shuffled uncomfortably as Gillen's voice grew louder. You have got to put all your bombs in that basin, not a stick starting on the edge and then doing its job, but every single bomb. Gillen's eyes blazed with fury, and with a flourish he tossed the photograph he had been holding onto the table in front of him placed both hands on its surface and leaned forward menacingly. If you can't manage it, Gillen said in a low, threatening voice, those bastards are going to come over here and invade us, and then you will have to fight them with your bare hands. Take a look at these, sir, Squadron Leader Cole said as he strode purposefully into Wing Commander Bennett's office at Adastral House on the 18th of July, 1940. Wing Commander Gillen was not the only senior officer preoccupied with photographs. "'Good Lord!' exclaimed a surprised Bennett after glancing at the enlarged black-and-white images of Aqueduct M25A. "'They've done it, Cole! They've bally well done it!' The photographs, taken earlier that morning by a PDU Spitfire, showed that the water had been drained from the aqueduct. The modern structure's electrically operated safety gates had been shut, closing the bridge to any through traffic. The aqueduct itself was untouched, but the bed of the canal on both sides showed evidence of damage, large holes scarring its drained bottom like moon craters. Look here, sir, at the bank, Cole said, pointing with a pencil. Bennett could see that one bomb had destroyed part of the bank, breaching the canal, just as William Holcrow had predicted it would. Bennett leaned back in his chair and thought for a moment. Well, Cole, he said after a few seconds, what do we think? A good show for five groups, sir. Of course, Bennett replied, his face serious. But the aqueduct itself is untouched. It's only going to take the Jerry's a few days at most to fill in these craters and repair the bank. Cole said nothing. Bennett was right. It was a start, but the really vital targets, the aqueducts, still stood proud and undamaged. I think it's time that the M-bombs, delivered en masse, are given another try, don't you? Squadron leader Cole nodded. 
The recommendations of Bennett's office would be more attacks on the aqueducts using M-bombs rather than general purpose ordnance, in conjunction with more nuisance raids on the canals and attacks on the gatherings of barges. More than anything, a decisive strike was needed at this juncture, for no matter how many barges the brave crews of 49 and 83 squadrons and the other five group stations bombed and sank in the North Sea ports, they were replaced by more and more arriving from inland. The Germans were managing to accumulate the numbers of vessels necessary to make Operation Sea Lion a reality, and at the same time, more aircraft and crews were failing to return from hair-raising raids on the canals as anti-aircraft defences continued to stiffen. It was a war of attrition that the British could not possibly win. I need to fix our position, Skipper. Pilot Officer Redmayne's worried voice crackled in Flight Lieutenant Joe Collier's earphones. I need to make a landfall. Navigation remained an unrefined art for the Hamden bomber squadrons, and even at night it was often necessary to rely on visual recognition of features on the ground once deep inside enemy territory. Redmayne, Collier's navigator, peered intently out of the perspex nose of the Hamden at the country below, glancing back to his map. Something was wrong. It was the 21st of July, and they were supposed to be on their way again to the big Heinkel factory at Wismar that 83 Squadron had bombed on the 27th of June. They should be over Denmark, but Redmayne wasn't sure. Roger, navigator, Collier replied, taking her down for a look-see. He eased the yoke forward and put the Hamden into a shallow dive, dropping to low altitude. The moon was up, and soon it was clear that they were over a large town. Redmayne desperately searched for some clue as to their location, but suddenly he realised his error. It was the German port of Kiel on the Baltic. They were way off course and completely alone. Christ! Collier shouted as the piercing beams of powerful searchlights flooded his cockpit with intense white light. They've coned us, boys, he yelled as a couple of searchlights locked on to his aircraft. Then the flat guns opened up. Hold on! I'll get us out of this, Collier shouted into the RT, immediately slamming the Hamden into a steep curving dive towards the ground. The technique was well practiced, dive and release flares that would hopefully blind the anti-aircraft gunners, giving Collier time to escape from the area. Flak shells exploded all around his aircraft as he dove for the earth, the wind screaming over the engine cowlings. It was only a matter of time before a German gun found its mark but no flares had yet been released. Get the damn things out, Bowman! Collier yelled into the RT as his ventral gunner, Pilot Officer Bowman, fumbled around in the back. There was no reply. The Hamden continued to plough on towards the ground, flak shells exploding and black puffs all around it, the piercing white lights of the searchlights pinning the aircraft in space. Collier levelled off very slow, and the searchlights finally broke contact. A few seconds later, they were clear of the flak and out over darkened countryside once more. Fearing Bowman was a casualty, Collier quickly spoke over the RT. Sergeant Johnson, he said, addressing his wireless operator and upper gunner. Get down there and find out what has happened to P.O. Bowman. Yes, Skipper, Johnson replied. A few seconds later, Johnson's breathless voice crackled once again in Collier's headset. He's gone, sir. Johnson said simply. You have been listening to The Bridge Busters, The First Dam Busters and The Race to Save Britain, written by Mark Felton, published by Mandalay Books, and narrated by Mark Felton. For great short films on a variety of military history subjects, please check out Mark Felton Productions on YouTube, and you can also help support both of my channels at PayPal and Patreon. Patreon.